Hi guys and welcome to episode 30 of the Your Progress Is Our Passion podcast. I'm joined today with Andrew Keeler. I'm hoping I pronounced that right. You did indeed. Yes! <laughs> um, Andrew is a champion bodybuilder. Uh, he's also a nutrition coach who, and physique coach that basically focuses also on mindset, the whole full package, so to speak. So I'm going to have a chat with him today about essentially how we got there. So... Andrew, give us a little bit of the background. Um, I first started as a personal trainer back in 2005. Um, that was when I originally qualified as far as personal training and nutrition. The psychology side of things really started to pick up around about, I'd say it was about 2012. Okay. 2011-2012. And it actually started during a contest prep because I'd bought a cross trainer for my garage mm -hmm. and really, really rapidly found that spending an hour in the garage looking at the garage door on a cross trainer with no music and nothing to watch was really fucking boring. <laughs> so I started taking my laptop out and I'd be watching different bodybuilding videos okay. that were on YouTube. And one day a completely random video popped up and it was Eric Thomas. And it was what is essentially his most uh, notable and his most famous talk that he delivered in a college. It was years and years ago. I think it was 2009 when it was originally filmed. Yeah. This was the back end of 2011, early 2012 when I saw it, which is the one where he's talking about when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, mm -hmm. then you'll be successful. Yeah. And... Um, and it was when I saw that, and there was just something about it just really, really resonated with me about the perspective of the way that you look at things. And then following on from that, a couple of other people popped up. Um, and there's other people that my brother's mentioned, because my brother has his own business, and he's like me, he's a big reader, yeah. big in mindset and things like that. Um, and it just kind of went from there. Okay. Um, have there been any other kind of people that have been quite influential? Like you say, you're a big reader. Has there been anything that's been the main quite interventional in changing your or broadening your perspective? Quite a number. Tony Robbins is one. Yep. Um, Zig Ziglar. Yep. Jim Rohn. Yep. Jim Rohn was Tony Robbins' yeah. mentor. Um, who else? Recent ones are Andy Frisella. Not come across him. Uh, he is the CEO of First Form okay. Nutrition, which is a supplement company. It's a, a bigger brand than just supplements now, but he does a podcast and all sorts, and I absolutely fucking love the guy. Yeah. Um, so Andy Frisella, Ed Myler, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk yeah. is another one. I follow, I've followed him for quite a, quite a long time now, quite a, a number of years. Um, who else? Les Brown. Okay. He's he's been around for decades now, but it's just something about him, something about his voice. It's just he's so easy to listen to. Mm. Um, and Doctor Eric Thomas. Okay, so for you, um, like going into like when was your first competition? What year? Two thousand five. Okay, so that you so basically straight after you pretty much qualified as a PT around at the same time was it? I qualified as a PT in the March of 2005 yeah. and I competed for the first time in the November Okay. 2005. How long had you been training before that point? For four years. Okay. And was it kind of something that you just fell into and thought oh, I wish you'd compete or was it what you wanted to I'd, do? I'd always wanted to. Okay. I'd, I'd been obsessed with bodybuilding and the, the form of a bodybuilder since I was little. Yeah. Um, all I know most people it stems from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me it stems from my granddad. Okay. Um, because he was just he was huge. Mm. He he had my shape but he was taller and bigger. Yeah. Um, and I always remember when I was little I, I remember I was sat at a birthday party and I was sat on the floor and my dad was stood here, my granddad was stood here, my uncle Jim was stood there. They're all talking. I was looking up. I was just thinking, why is why is Granddad so much bigger than everybody else? And obviously, as I got older, I, I understood that it was because of his muscle mass. And even at that time, he wasn't as big as he used to be. Yeah. And it just kind of formulated into an obsession. And then obviously the superhero thing comes in, Superman, Batman. And then, as I got a little bit older, I think it was maybe Terminator. Okay. That I'd seen. Yeah. And um, too young to have seen it. 
Yeah. But well, I saw it anyway. Yeah, there's, like, there's countless films that I'm like, everyone's like, have you seen such and such? Like, yeah, when I was too young to watch it. <laughs> yeah. There's a few that I really should revisit, revisit as an adult. Well, that was it, and it was, it, again, that opening scene. Yeah. So you want to time travel like, naked. Yeah, <laughs> still do. <laughs> no, but it was it was that, and I was just like, I have to look like that. Yeah, it just looks fucking awesome. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So your granddad was he? Had he done like? Had he done any training to get there, or was he just a natural monster? He was naturally gifted with his, his shape, but he was a miner. Oh, uh, okay. And it was back in the day when shit wasn't on trolleys, so yeah. he'd be holding like a, a, a huge drill that probably weighed. 30 kilos in a really awkward position so yeah and that's what he'd be doing all day yeah well this is this is something i talk about with clients all the time they're like oh because i work in like a, a more like i don't know boot campy type gym now we've got we've got a lot of strongman equipment and stuff in there but we've got zero machines right and people are like well how can you do what you used to be able to in the old gym it's like well i can't exactly do all the things but essentially i can teach you to move i can get you stronger i can i can teach you all the planes of motion and mm-hmm. all that stuff because this stuff, being able to get muscle, has existed long before, you know, life fitness came along and sold you 17 versions of a chest press. Yeah. So, yeah, so I was, that's why I was interested in, like, if, the, if, you, if, you know, your granddad had been sort of in one of the earlier gyms, because they weren't massively popular until out of them, were they? No. Which is... No, I mean, the, the thing was, it was my, my shape, I'm, I'm within competing, I'm known for how small my waist is. Mm-hmm. Um, because once I've dieted down, and obviously due, due to the volume of food being so low, the actual size of my my abdomen, the food volume inside has dropped to its minimum. My waist, when I'm ready for a show, is between 27 and 28 inches. Mm-hmm. So it, do, it does go really small. <laughs> and my granddad, when he was 24, if I remember correctly, I always remember my grandma telling me about she had to make his clothes. Mm. because they couldn't buy clothes for him because of his dimensions how big his chest was in comparison to his waist because he had a 25 inch waist mm. so there's obviously a genetic component there which he's yeah. conveniently passed on to you yes and I, <laughs> and I, and I love it yeah I was going to say I think all my dad passed on to me was this hairline and um, the eccentricity to try and be the centre of attention whenever there's an option um, which I'm trying to outgrow but um, <laughs> <laughs> every now- Every now and then, that, you know. that maturity thing is massively overrated. Well, I think it's a pro. It's when it's having known when to apply it. Yeah, like having the ability to switch on maturity and then switch it off and be an absolute kid. That's that's the ideal for me. Yeah, but that's like the ideal of being having be able to be able to have one donut and switch off and having have twelve of them. That's just not in, that's not in my capacity yet. Um. So. Obviously, the, the cardio like was one of the things that where you need to switch your mindset in that first build up to that first competition. What else was like? What what were the struggles there? If there were any. Uh, to be honest, that that very first prep was probably the least stressful that I've ever had. Okay. And it was because I was going in. I I understood the basics of training. Uh, through what I'd seen through I mean even by that point at 19 I'd probably watched Pumping Iron about 300 times yeah because one of my dad's friends Neil back when I was 15 lent me the video uh, and I watched it and then rewound it and watched it again and rewound it and watched it again Cause that's it, right kids we had to rewind it, videos it was back in the VHS days <laughs> <laughs> um, and all, all I did the prep was 8 weeks so it was super short because I didn't have the concept of, of time that it would take. Yeah. And I, I was in relatively good condition at that point anyway. Uh, but like when I dieted down, I think, what did I wear? I think it was like 11 stone two or something okay. when, I was, when I was ready for the show. Yeah. All my cardio was, was 20 minutes walking on a treadmill on maximum incline, walking as fast as I possibly could. Mm. So it's one of those, if you slow down a little bit or miss step, you want to be on your ass. <laughs> I used to do that every day that I trained and the days that I didn't train. So if I was going out Saturday and Sunday off, I just did nothing. Um, my diet stayed largely the same. I just ate less. Yeah. And that was about it. Fair enough. My training stayed exactly the same. I didn't alter the way that I trained my legs or anything else at all. It was just the inclusion of this 20 minutes of... I, I, I suppose we would now call it constant medium intensity cardio yeah. so there was no fluctuations it was just get to a, 
that level right at the start and just maintain it all the way through. Yeah. And that was it. Eight weeks right. for sure. And how does that contrast with how you prep now? Now, I would much rather do a lot more cardio so I could eat more. Okay. Because like I explain with clients and just people that I speak to in the gym, you can create the deficit that you need in order to lose the body fat, either through restriction of calories yeah. or through increase of expenditure. And for me, I would, I would always rather do more and eat more than eat less. Yeah. You always end up eating less anyway, but the longer I can put that off, mm-hmm. better. Yeah. Because for me as well, I've got to be able to keep my mind working. Yeah so that I can still look after my clients to the best of my ability, as well as looking after the kids and everything else. So, yeah. Because you've got to maintain life around it, don't you? Yeah. Is it, so you said it was your least stressful prep for the first one. Is it more stressful now, or is it is it just still something that you can just take in your stride, to a degree? Yeah. I don't think anyone can take bodybuilding prep in their stride. But. I think you kind, of, you kind of go through a peak and a trough with it. Your, your first contest, because it's your first contest, You've got no, or most people, have no real knowledge of, of what to expect. Because you don't set an expectation, there's not as much worry with it, or at mm. least that's the way it was for me. So I just kind of picked the show that I wanted to do, started doing what I thought I needed to do in order to get rid of the body fat in time, and it worked. Yeah. And then the longer you do it for, the more you scrutinise and you second-guess yourself, your self-doubt, and it's that second guessing yourself that creates the stress yeah and then over time as your experience builds even more and more you learn to trust yourself more and more so I'm at the position now where I know what I put in place is going to work yeah so I don't second guess myself I won't be following a diet plan for three days and look in the mirror and think oh I don't look any different funk is not looking <laughs> I need to change something change something and then I'll the, the, it'll be like a, a micro change yeah and then I panic and I think oh fuck I've gone flat I need to eat more and because I went through that in the middle stage yeah and was a little bit, little bit more mind games and stuff going on in that phase yeah it's like kind of you know enough to worry you but not enough to put your mind at ease basically yeah it's almost like the, the knowledge that you have got is the reason why you overthink everything mm-hmm. because you, well you know yourself the more you learn the more you realise you don't know yeah so that for every one thing that you do learn, you realise there's a hundred other things to do with that one thing that you aren't aware of yet. Yeah. And obviously you've got everything that's a contrast, so your body has that reaction to that change yeah. and it will have the opposite reaction in another way because you've got another hormone that's going to increase to make sure that that hormone doesn't increase too much and vice versa. So. Yeah. And it's just a case of getting to the point where you know enough to keep yourself level. Yeah. And in t- that's obviously how your preps have changed over time. How, because it's 13 years since 2005, so it's, that makes you suddenly feel old. <laughs> I was 19. You're <laughs> um, still younger than me. Um, <laughs> and how's the, because like, obviously I've personally seen the, the bodybuilding industry change a lot in the last four or five years. Yeah. How has it changed? How is it different now than what it was like in 2005? To be honest, the first show that I did, there was nobody there other than bodybuilders. Hmm. It was a bodybuilding show, and the only people that were there were bodybuilders. From the junior class that I was in through to the masters, that was it. Yeah. And it was just it was a it was a different environment. I mean, the the industry itself back then was nothing like it is now. In any respect, hmm. in size or anything. It was completely, completely different. Yeah. Even down to things like accessible information. There was the 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 sort of things that you've got access to now through your phone, through your laptop, that's readily available all the time. That's like genuine sound information, like uh, Joe Bennett, the hypertrophic coach, his website. Oh, yeah. Jordan Peters, trained by JP. Those sorts of websites. They're invaluable. I totally people. get him and Jordan Peterson mixed up all the time, which is <laughs> they're not in a way. No, <laughs> no, they're not. But those sorts of just wells of information just didn't exist back then. You had mm. magazines and message boards were 
they'd started, but they were still in their infancy. Like back then, I think bodybuilding.com mm-hmm. was really the only one that will have been around. Because I first joined bodybuilding.com in 2001. Mm. Uh, so just before I was finishing in high school and stuff like that. And again, a lot of the information on it, it wasn't coming from you know, like qualified, reputable people. Like if you go on those sorts of websites now, musculardevelopment.com and stuff like that, you have people like Jordan Peters to speak to. Mm-hmm. Whereas back then you didn't. You just had other random people that were also trying to bumble the way through. Yeah. Just sharing information and sharing ideas. Almost everything was anecdotal. Oh, yeah. There was no, this is this, and here's the research study, the peer-reviewed clinical study that proves that that's the way that things work. Mm-hmm. Um, that for me from my perspective but I think that's more of the professional perspective of the way that the industry's changed yeah. the competitive side of things there's a lot of people that don't like the way it is now mm-hmm. because like the bikini girls the bikini boys as they call them and stuff like that I didn't even realise they were calling them that <laughs> yeah but it's like there's just this massive disrespect towards the other classes that have come into the industry mm. that aren't bodybuilding by the older bodybuilders or the older generation of bodybuilders. Right. Even people that started when I did back when it was bodybuilding. But for me, there's more benefit to them being there than the way that it used to be. Okay. Like the way that, well, for example, the PCA. Mm. I've got friends that I went to watch compete last year that were winning money. Yeah. You know, they, they were putting the heart and soul into that prep, the same as they've been doing for the past decade, but they were coming away with something for it other than just a trophy. Yeah. Um, I, there's pros and cons. There's good points and bad points. There's lots of people at Body Power that I'd love to fucking clothesline as I'm walking past them just because they look a twat. But I'm, that's the day I'm doing the toughest model this year, so I'm not even going. <laughs> <laughs> It's over the full weekend. You can, I'm, you can I'm, still I'm running, come and enjoy I'm running the on the Saturday night. Actually, it's in Birmingham, you know. It's like, it's, only, it's not far. I could probably pop in on the Saturday. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm going to go for Friday for freebies. But, um, yeah, no, I think everyone, like, literally everyone in Body Power wants to clothesline someone else in that building because there's just so much rivalry and people thinking that their way is the right way and yeah. stuff. And I guess, I guess the, um, the bodybuilding crowd... But particularly the old school bodybuilding crowd, they've they've been there and they've been established for a longer time, so they probably feel a little bit more justified in having that opinion rather than like maybe someone who's like a physique, or like, you know, like one of the more recent things yeah. turning around and saying, "Oh, the bodybuilders are all old fashioned or whatever they're saying." So yeah, but there is there is so much segregation in that in that place. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the issues that I've got is it's like when you get the bodybuilders that are from that genre that they almost speak as if the the newcomers owe us something. Because mm. it's like, oh, it's all stemmed from bodybuilding. It's just like, yeah. Well, it's just part of the evolution of the industry. It's just the way that it is. Mm. But their inclusion in the industry has increased the number of people that are interested in the industry. There's been a massive boom in supplements, so obviously the amount of supplements that are available I don't mean just individual companies but like the research that goes into the supplements that we can use that genuinely work yeah. is now massively different than it was when I first started back in 2005 yeah. or when I first started training back in 2001 but the fact that we're in a position where now amateur competitors are making money mm-hmm. and going competing abroad where they can win like real money mm-hmm. it's not like Four hundred pounds, which is like it's good because it yeah. takes away some of the costs that you've that you've had to invest in to get ready for the contest. Yeah. I'm talking like the Wild Classic and things like that, where you're looking at like the winner gets a hundred grand mm. or more. And this is still amateur. Just, yeah. yeah. Um, that's the side that I like to focus on because it's like with anything, your perspective of a situation is more important than the situation Absolutely. itself. Absolutely. Then, like how I normally word that is your perspective of a problem is more important than the problem itself mm-hmm. if you go into something and you only focus on the negative that's all you're going to see Yeah. so whatever you focus on in life or in a situation you're going to see and create more of Yeah. so if you constantly go to body power as a bodybuilder and there's professional bodybuilders there to meet there's seminars that you can go to with people like Phil Lerney, Phil Graham, Dr. Scott Stevenson, 
you know, like people that have got this ridiculous wealth of knowledge that they're, just, they're sharing. Yeah. You can go and you can sit in there, you can take notes, you can spend the entire weekend just absorbing information that you're going to spend the rest of the year improving your training, your nutrition, yeah. supplementation, everything else with. That's my whole point of going. Or you can walk around like a sour-faced bitch <laughs> looking at and paying attention to all the shit that you say you don't want to see. Yeah. If I don't like a film, if there's a film with an actor in that I fucking hate, I'm not going to go out and buy all of his DVDs and sit here watching and go, I fucking hate this guy. <laughs> it's a shit actor. Stupid. I just mm. don't understand. It's like when... The only time that I will go and watch one of the competitions is if it's bodybuilding, I'll go and watch because that is where my interest lies. Mm. But if I've got a friend that's a physique competitor or a muscle model or a friend that's a bikini competitor and he or she are going to be competing, I won't watch them mm. because I'm just supporting a friend. Yeah. So I remove all everything else that goes with it, of whether it annoys me that they're there or anything else and just go and support my friend. Yeah. And it's not difficult to do that not difficult to be there and not focus on the shit that you don't like because mm. it's not like there's a shortage of things to see because it's like uh, it popped up on Facebook the other day uh, the announcement that Callum Best is going to be there Yeah. Now, when I saw that that's the first that I've seen of this Callum Best I don't actually know who he is I've heard the name before um, but yeah I saw and I saw the announcement the other day and I, 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 I think I'd heard the name but I didn't know who he was well that was it he was announced as one of the people that's going to be there and there was this big furore about it, about how he doesn't belong there, and he's a, he's a nobody in the industry, and, and blah blah blah. And it's just like, don't don't go and see him then. Yeah. That's that's how difficult that is, because on the same day, it was also announced that Terry Hollands is going to be there, mm. third strongest man in Europe, and Dimitri Klokov, two people that I would genuinely like to go and meet and speak to. Yeah. Someone that even in a five minute conversation will be able to teach you something that you'd be able to take and, and improve your own training with or something. Yeah. Focus on that. Three people were announced and people focusing on the one person that they deem not worthy of being there. Yeah. It's just like, who, who are you to say that he's not? So there's an element of jealousy at play there. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of the, the amateur bodybuilders that I see talking shit about the physique lads. And you compare the picture, it's just like, well, if that physique lad put trunks on, he'd fucking destroy you on stage. Mm. Ruin you. Yeah. You know, it's just like um, Romain Lansford. If he put trunks on, he wouldn't look out of place on a bodybuilding stage because he's got legs. Yeah. He's not just got legs, he has good legs. And they're all round as well. But he has chosen his discipline to be physique and he's now moved to classic bodybuilding. Yeah. Because that's what his, his structure is gifted for that. But if he wanted to do bodybuilding with the condition that he gets in and the muscularity that he's got, he'd, he'd blow most people away that complain about physique competitors. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, the, we're, I'm touching on the jealousy thing. I, I kind of come to a bit of a realisation about myself of, oh, about two months ago. And I wrote it on my blog, is my secret life as a fat shamer. And um, I'm not a fat shamer. <laughs> so I hope this doesn't get taken out of context. But I remember, like, short. Well, not when I when I, I I was bullied for being fat. I was bullied originally for being smart. I was only in like the 14th worst school in the country, so I'm not the world's smartest person. But I was smart by their standards. And then as a result, I went to comfort eating and I got fat. And then I was bullied for being fat. And um, as a result, when I kind of like. I, because I've been picked on for being fat when when the whole the the the, the sort of um, how do I say this not the, the, the when the, the group of sort of like fatter comedians came through you know like when um, uh, Zach Galifianakis mm. the, the guy from Hangover and uh, what's their name Melissa McCarthy when they came through and it was like and you've got like fat funny people on TV that this weird sort of jealousy came out of me at first and I was just like they shouldn't be on there they're not funny blah, blah, blah. and I was like and you know they were funny they were yeah. they, they were they were good actors and they were they were making good you know, good films but cuz I've been picked on for being fat and therefore I've been taught in the past that fat people aren't to be loved and aren't to be successful and all this I still have that sort of weird jealousy and some sort of borderline hatred going on inside me and it's yeah. like something that I kind of had to address because it was just 
which has given me reason to rant from no, you know, that. Yeah. And I was, I was just because of what I was focusing on, really. The same as what you said before. It's like if you want to focus on something to to rant at, there's always there's always plenty of options. Yeah, because that's it. There'll be, there'll be two people that view the exact same situation in a completely, completely different way. Yeah. You viewed it and you saw that because they were fat, they didn't either deserve or shouldn't have been in the position they were in. And there'll be somebody else that, because they're fat, they, they really support them and they love the fact that they're in the position that they're in. And I think that was what really pissed me off. It's because I, I used to wear glasses as well, which is one of the reasons I was I, I was thought of as being smart, because obviously if you wear glasses, you're super intelligent. Yeah. Um, and that was like you know was one of the things I was picked on for. And then when celebrities came out and started wearing bloody the clear ones, I was like fuming for a good like couple of years. I mean, this was like I you know late teens. I'm glad to say that I've grown up a little bit since then. But yeah, like just because in my mind somewhere it had been placed this idea that oh well you 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 I'm personally worthless because of my glasses or I'm personally yeah. worthless because of my fat. So why has this person got a worth because of that? And instead of as you say celebrating it, which is what I should have been doing, I should have been saying good finally it's kind of like it's you know it's becoming okay to have glasses or it's becoming okay to be fat. Yeah. Like you know. I mean I, that that's the thing there again. That's that's the perspective is that people still single in on that thing so it's like the fact that that person's fat mm -hmm. it's got nothing to do with their talent no. they're not talented because they're fat it's not like if they lost weight they'd suddenly lose all their acting skills or stop being funny yeah. but people focus on that and they'll still signal in on that one thing then that person will be championed because they're doing that even though they're fat Mm -hmm. It's like, well, the fat's off, come on. Yeah. It's like everybody wants to be treated as an equal. And if you want to be treated as an equal, then you shouldn't be knocked down for something. But at the exact same time, you can't be championed for it either. Mm -hmm. So it's like if somebody does something and they are fat when they do it, people will make a point of it. Oh, it's amazing that he's done this even though he weighs 20 stone. It's just like, well... If people want to be treated as equals, remove the fact that he is big and just celebrate the fact that he's done it. Yeah. Don't make the point that he deserves extra praise and accolades because he's done it whilst being like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as you say, it's 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 where people are placing the focus and media places the focus and art, like you know articles online. Yeah. Which I was going to ask you before, and I'll bring it back to that now. What? How is because obviously since again two thousand and five the the internet and, and the social media landscape it pr practically wasn't in it. you know we had MySpace I think in two thousand and five maybe even you, maybe YouTube even didn't not. even exist yeah so how is how has that changed things in the in the world of bodybuilding um, again there's positives and negatives because social media gives people a voice within the industry that don't deserve one yeah and again that as a standalone statement can make it sound like I. Um, showing the issue that you were just talking about yeah but for me it's from a danger perspective absolutely because that's the situation with yourself was just having the wrong perspective on the situation and being jealous from it for me it's people that are given a voice and for whatever reason whether they're funny or they're just a likeable person it's the way that they put themselves across end up with a huge following people follow their advice and it's shit advice mm -hmm and it's dangerous and people shouldn't be following it that's one of the worst things from the explosion of social media for me yeah. giving people that otherwise wouldn't be able to influence people the ability to influence people mm -hmm. when they've not really got anything to give yeah I mean on the flip side of that it gives people a platform that like that maybe in the past well are worthy of sharing that information but maybe in the past wouldn't have had yeah. been able to like you know when you say like we, we briefly touched on equality it's like social media takes away the gatekeeper it takes away the person that says you're you know you you can have a, you can have a voice today there's yeah. no there's no kind of like media boss on like channel four saying like yeah you can't, you can't go on instagram you can't do this so it does allow it allows good through as well as the bad but yeah unfortunately there does tend, tend, tend to be like the bad I think the bad often talks louder <laughs> do, you, do you know what I think a lot of the problem is with that comes back down to the jealousy thing mm. because there's a lot of people that I see that are good at what they do and could be very very good at what they do but they spend an inordinate amount of the time talking about the bad right instead of focusing on making their good better yeah um, 
and that I think is a huge reason why the bad does tend to get pushed because it's someone that is good and people see as um, either honest or a trustworthy voice mentions someone that's shit mm -hmm. people will go and look up that person and then when you look up this person that has just been reported to be a dickhead but they're funny mm -hmm. people go and watch a few videos and just make some laugh and just go oh, I like this guy he's funny follow mm -hmm. whereas somebody may go in the other direction and the good person won't get the same amount of followers because they're not putting on a performance for people yeah for me, if something is bad, I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing that people want to try and get rid of it. But the best way to fight it is to just put out more good content. Yeah. Instead of trying to shit on the bad, over just overwhelm it with good. Yeah. And one of the worst things is that there's good people that refuse to either work with or share work of other good people. Mm. I see that a lot. <laughs> Whereas you will get people that aren't involved in the industry at all that will freely share the bad information because it's funny. Yeah. So their scope, their ability to grow is massively, massively above the good side because there's less good to begin with and the ones that are good before they become great believe that they need to protect what they think. Yes. Like, oh, if I, if, if I share the way that I calculate that for my clients that other people do it and I'll lose clients and, and I won't make as much money it's just like listen there's, there's 70 million people in this country you've got Instagram and you've got Facebook you've got access to about 3 billion people if you can't make a living doing what you do if you are genuinely good at it then you are not genuinely good at it mm. but people have this constant scarcity mindset of, there's not enough clients yeah. there's not enough clients I can't, I can't get enough clients and then because they've not got as much of what they need, they focus on the people that have an abundance yeah. and then hate them for it. But it's like you said then about like you don't, people don't want to give out their information. It's this, this fear that someone else will use it. Or, or you, The thing is, in our profession, we're not paid for what we know. We're paid on delivering what we know. Yeah. And we can deliver that through a book and a person can read that book and then still get more out of having us deliver it to them in person, the exact same stuff, because yeah. of the accountability, because of the non-verbal communication, because of you know various other reasons, even down to as simple as if they invest five quid in a book or 50 quid in a session, it's like they feel more invested in them and therefore work a bit harder. Yeah. And so there's the idea for me, like I, like I literally as soon as I believe have an idea, generally tend to put it out. And it's like, the thing is, about six people will see it, and then I might have to put the same idea out of it about six months later, and about twenty people will see it. Yeah. But no, you know, if someone, if we have one of those six people stealing it, then great. <laughs> it's like, you know, but yeah, I'm not... that's the thing. At the end of the day, that person that takes your idea and thinks that's really good, I'm going to use that with my clients. They're then perpetuating something that's good. Yeah, that's what you want. Exactly. But you, there's so many people in the industry. They can, I mean, you see it. I see it all the time. Somebody like Phil Lerner will post something and it might be on his story, it might be on his main page, it might be on Facebook or it might be a section of a video that is posted, say it's a 10 minute video and there'll be one little nugget mm. in the middle of it that really, really speaks and then over the course of say the next two to three days you can see people posting content and it might be it's been in a video but somebody will post it as a worded status. Yeah but they pass it off as their own. Mm. And it's like, yeah, good. So you're sharing Phil's information, but instead of just sharing Phil's information and saying, this is fucking spot on, I couldn't agree with this more, mm -hmm. and sharing it in that respect, they have to take it and try and reword it to make it sound like they're wrong. Mm. But you know, there's not, there's no, there's very, f I wouldn't say maybe no is the wrong word, but there's no such real thing as a, as a unique thought anymore. No. Everything that's ever, every, like I, I'm, I don't like the term intellectual property. It's, it's, it's cool when you're yeah. dealing with like maybe a character, like bloody Mickey Mouse or something like. If you've invented something. Yeah. Then, yeah. But if you're sharing information about the, about the human body, about fitness, nutrition or something like that, it's not, it's not unique. No. Essentially, and a lot of people act like you know their way of teaching the bench press, like they invented it. It's like you know, um, this which, is the this is the way I do it. Yeah, and it's just like this is the correct way. No, it's the correct way for you. It's a way. Yeah. Yeah, 
Like I had um, one of the guys in the gym a little while back say because we were I was having we had the sled loaded up re- like pretty damn heavy, um, and you've got like the two high handles on one side and the two low handles on the other. And I was only having my clients go down with it with on the high handles, then turn it around and come back on the high handles. Yeah. And um, this guy was like, "Well, that's not the right way to do that sled. You should be using the low handles." And I'm like, "Like, first of all." If I want, if with that load on, they're not moving it on the low handles. Yeah. It's just not happening, and I want them doing doubles. So, and he's like, "That's not." But his expression was, "That's not the right way to use it." And I was like, "No, that's a way to use it." And I was like, "And um, he was a coach as well." I was just like, there's, "There's not really a space. I don't think anymore for us to say this is the way. This is the right way." It's yeah. like saying that we are all, you know, seven point eight billion of us or whatever there is. There's probably a lot more than that. You're better with statistics than me um, on this planet. Are one. It's like, and and one thing will work for all of us. Yeah. And. Um, it's just like I, as soon as someone says this is the only way I generally tend to stop listening yeah. like I'm quite happy to have like conversations with vegans I've had a vegan cafe owner on the, on the podcast um, really early on super lovely girl awesome awesome chef like, like love her food Th- and thankfully she never turned around to me and said that the, the veganism is the only way that things should be because if she had done I'd have switched off listening at that yeah. point um, because I'm here to kind of be told some information and then be able to make my own mind up about it. But if someone says this is the only way, I become very, very kind of closed off to it straight away. Yeah, because it's just for me that's just it's ignorance mm-hmm. to believe that your way is the only way. But again, that comes back to people wanting to stand out because they want people to think their way is special. Yeah, well, you can't sell so open source information, can you? Exactly. So you have to make it out to be that you've got something unique. And we do have something unique, as I said before, the way we package it. Like, if me and you knew the exact same thing, just by the different intricacies in our personalities, we would package that in slightly different ways. If we, if, you know, if we were limited to the exact same pool of knowledge. And we, we'd deliver it in different ways. And yeah. there'd be different people that would be more attracted to your way, and there'd be different people that are more attracted to my way. Exactly. And that's okay. <laughs> no, that, that, that's it. But I, everybody knows me. In with it, anybody that knows me within the industry knows me to be blunt. Yep. And unflinchingly honest. Yep. I don't. That's why I wanted to interview you. I, I, well, the thing is that that's just the way that I've always been, and that's the way that I'm raising my children to be. Yeah. I'm making the point that honesty is always the best way because, it's like I always say, you can get caught in a lie can't get caught in the truth yeah. because it's just it's absolute it's the truth um and that's 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 why i am the way i am yeah. but the way i deliver my information some people love it yeah other people fucking hate it because some people will hear what i've said and it will be like a punch in the face for them yeah and no one likes being punched in the and, uh, No, but that's the thing, though. It's an emotional truth that they've needed to be told for maybe a decade. Mm-hmm. And nobody around them has had the balls to say it. And then all of a sudden, I come along with my wonderful, whimsical Northern accent and just <laughs> slap them in the face with it. And I have people that message me and they're like, I needed to fucking hear this. Yeah. And I'm going to do something about it. Other people will see it and they will take it as a punch in the face but will react emotionally to it. It's going, oh, it's a fucking dickhead. Mm. might be right but they're not ready to hear what I've said in the way that I've said it yeah. whereas you could deliver the exact same information in a different package and they go oh yeah you're right yeah. but I'm not going to try and be the guy that everybody likes I'm going to be me and people will either like me or they won't people will either gravitate to me or they won't Yeah. so I don't I, I don't worry myself about trying to adapt you can see people that don't know what they want their identity to be within the fitness industry they don't know what kind of coach they want to be because they just want to be popular yeah they don't want to teach people they want to be popular they want to have a huge following they want their instagram account to have care after the followers instead of just numbers so do i i want the swipe up thing but the, the, the thing is, though, is that there's, there's numerous that you can see and as you watch the stories and you watch the, the content that they post, it's up and down. One day they, they're going for the brutal honesty approach and then the next day they're doing the little funny and being like really sweet with everybody approach and then a 
two or three days later, it's different again. Mm. And it doesn't work. Because it's like you're listening to different people. Yeah. And no one's going to be able to like a, a, like bond to that person and their style if the style's all over the fucking place. Yeah. But like going to a restaurant, but like having a favourite restaurant, but every time you go in, they're serving a different type of food. Mm. And should we go to that Chinese place we went last week? It was really, really good. You get there, it's an Indian. Yeah. And then the next time you go to serving pizza, you'd be like, what's this? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I first kind of found, I think I think the first thing I ever, the very first thing I saw you was something that Ben Coomer reposted. But I think you were, it was either on that or once I started digging in that I saw that you talked about mental health mm. a hell of a lot. Um, why is it that you choose to do that via your Instagram? Um, to be honest of all of the social media platforms Instagram is the one that I like the most okay. because Instagram is the most controllable with regards to the content that you want to see and that you're going to expose yourself to because you choose who you follow mm -hmm. and you are only going to see that content whereas with Facebook somebody that you are friends with might like or comment on something that you don't follow or someone's that you're not friends with and it'll pop up in your feed yeah and that is that isn't really controllable it's very difficult to weed that sort of crap out mm -hmm. so you can constantly have your your environment influenced by somebody else's actions which i don't like and i okay. I, I say that to my clients i get some clients that i, I try to make the point that make the things in your life that you can control as controlled as possible and the things that you can't control pay no attention to them or remove them from your life if you can mm. so for me Facebook I don't use anywhere near as much as I use Instagram and I don't use it as a tool for promoting what I do mm -hmm. for that reason Instagram I just there's just something about it I like how how structured it is you know, like anything that I search for, the people that I follow, the things that I like, if I go on my explore page, it's only going to be things of that nature yeah. pop up. I'm not going to randomly see something that I'm like, that, that, that angers me or upsets me yeah. or, or anything else. Um, and that's, that's part of the reason why I use it because anybody that is invested in mental health will over time start to see me and other people that follow the same patterns, mm -hmm. that teach the same lessons and have the same focus. So you can end up in very good company by association. Yeah. It's just, for me, Instagram's the best social media platform. Yeah, I've, I've met a lot of really cool people through it. Yeah. Um, I've gone on to meet a lot of them in real life now. Um, yourself. I mean, yeah. yeah what, you being one of them. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, particularly because uh, cause I kind of, I follow the, men the like mental health hashtags quite a lot mm. um, and just see what else is around. And there's one thing I've been really pleased about, like this like last sort of nine months or so, is there is actually a lot more around than people seem to think. And there's a lot more people saying some really good stuff in mental health. There's a lot more people like putting together foundations and putting together groups. There's one I came across recently called Andy's Man Club. Um, it was like run by an ex rugby player called Luke Handler, and it's literally just a, a weekly. On I think it's on a Monday night at seven, like every week. Like and there's loads of them. There's I think there's one round here somewhere. There's one in Bolton, um, all around the northwest, and they're just basically clubs for, for men to meet up and talk about their mental health. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's a there's a guy called Ministry of Change who's like literally driving around the country in a camper van just trying to interview people that are working with mental health. There's like mental health. There's a fest. There's a festival in. Brighton, Bristol, Bristol, celebrating mental health, like the positive aspects of it and everything. Yeah. It's just, it's really nice to kind of see what's going on. And Instagram, like, I used to, a lot of people said that's what they got, they use Twitter for that stuff. I've never, never, just never got found, found my way with Twitter probably, but with Instagram. I deactivated my account mm. because I found that every time I went on Twitter, everything was just fucking negative mm. all the time. It was like Twitter had become the complaint the platform. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly I did complain to BT say. on there recently, just... <laughs> Because I've got terrible internet, hence why I'm using yours to upload my videos. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. That's and I just thought every time I went on, I was just seeing shit that I didn't care about. Mm. And but the, not only did I not care about it, but people getting really angry, people getting completely vexed about something that has no impact on the life. Yeah. 
and that is one thing social media is a lot of good with that everything that you were just saying about mental health and the way that it's it's creating more and more and more and more content and places for people to go but through the growth of social media and people's learning and understanding of mental health it's now creating physical places for people to go yeah. so it's not just sitting in your house on your own with your phone in your hand trying to get a connection with someone from a distance people can now go and interact with people Yeah, that's the good side of it the yeah. negative and a lot of it comes from perspective people seeing something and be like oh I'm so fucking angry about this I hate this you see people share shit on Facebook mm. and they share and say, this is so upsetting why are you sharing yeah. it I'm raising awareness for what yeah. What 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 is you raising awareness going to do about about that one particular thing? And it will do nothing. But all it does is exposes their followers to something that is a negative. Exactly. And you pass it. It's like yeah. Why if you if you had like a piece of shit in your hand, would you want to go and spread your hand all over? You get your friends to all put their hands up and smear it on the top. Exactly. Yeah, it's just it's it's ludicrous. We but we it's just it's just the the wonder of the negativity bias. I suppose like you know it's it was built in us to keep us safe like two thousand years ago and make it help us to go was that a saber tooth tiger? Yeah, it bloody well was. And now it's just it's got no saber tooth tigers to look for, so it's looking for anything. So you mean that's it? The the part of the brain that's responsible for keeping us safe, our fight our flight response. That, that safe is a very weird term these days as well because. Safe from what? <laughs> yeah, from horrible words that from scare us and, pro- and pronouns yeah. and things like that. Yes. <laughs> Did you just assume my identity? My gender? <laughs> okay, I'm offended. No, it's like the, that, that area of the brain doesn't understand anything other than like a, a yes or no system. Mm-hmm. It's just like safety. It understands keeping you safe, keeping you out of harm's way. It doesn't understand anything else. And then you've got the emotional centre of the brain, the amygdala, which is where most people rule their life from. Mm. And that, there's a, a really good book that I've got called The Chimp Paradox. Yes, I read it while I was on holiday. And that, I most people need to read that. Yeah. And again, it's one of those things, some people will read it and they would see that they govern their life with their chimp. Mm. They live in the emotional centre of the brain. They don't use the intelligent part of the brain to make decisions. And they would be offended by the book, yeah. giving them facts. And they wouldn't do anything about it. But it's fucking it's Yeah, wrong. I came away from it and just like, my chimp is a dick. <laughs> <laughs> he's a, oh, he's, he's a knobhead. <laughs> but that's it. And it's, but that's the sort of thing that people need to be exposed to because yeah. ability to control something is born through understanding. Mm-hmm. So if you understand why you do what you do, you can then understand how to stop doing what you do. Yeah. So if you're constantly a knobhead and it's because you just have a thought and you act on it like that, if you understand that you can have a thought and then go, I'm just going to chill for 10 or 15 minutes before I post this comment back on Facebook or before I share something or before I say something to someone out and about, if I wait 10 minutes and I still feel exactly the same way and I'm still irate about it, I'm going to wait another 10 minutes mm-hmm. because majority of the time after that initial flurry that thing that's really pissed you off you don't give a shit about it after 5 minutes yeah now one thing this morning you know I said I was running at like 4.15 this morning because I'm so hardcore um, <laughs> hashtag, my chip, my, my, hashtag the grind yeah exactly um, I think my chimp wasn't awake by then so it didn't like so he was just like because I, I quite enjoyed I don't enjoy running very or very rarely um, it's running. It's yeah. horrific. <laughs> but yeah, he wasn't. Yeah, I was away, but my chimp wasn't away. But no, that that was the the big one of the things I really took from that book was um, it's we got we don't really need to feel because like sometimes what comes in and like our initial emotional response can be quite horrible really, and it can be something that we're even to a degree ashamed of the fact that we even thought that. You know, like you, you may you may see someone and like I think badly about the person or whatever, and you know you say you, 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 your rational, the you side of it, the, the human brain part of it, actually knows that to to want to not accept that initial thought, yeah. and we have that choice, like we have that ability to kind of just go, okay, I feel shit about that now. There's two there's two options. It's like that point. It's like I feel shit about that. Am I a horrible person? Or there's the okay, what really matters is what I do. 
once this thought has arrived. Like with like the, the expression I use for it is we can't really take we can't we can't control what guests arrive at our door, but we can control how we treat them. So we can't really control the thoughts that arrive. The very before we've got conscious thought on it. The thoughts that come into our head originally are sort of knee-jerk reactions. We can't control that, but we can control how we treat that thought. Yeah. So like this, and I, and I work with this with people with depression, with anxiety, with all sorts of things because they we put so much stock on these initial thoughts. It's like you know, um, if someone is like 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 the me, the the the, the fat shaming me that was in my head. No one was actually ever fat shamed. I wasn't there, like shouting at the TV. I didn't like phone up Melissa McCarthy and be all like, "You fat, you shouldn't be on telly." Yeah. But the thought that I arrived at my door was, "You fat, you shouldn't be on telly." Now, I didn't react on that, and I didn't kind of then go on to put that toxicity back out into the world. Um, doesn't does it make me a bad person that that thought arrived? I don't think it does. No. But I mean, it took me a while to understand why that thought was arriving. But you know. Uh, it's like having that ability to say, yeah, okay, that's arrived, but no, I don't want to deal with that. And, yeah. you know, we, we do that in other things in life. It's like, you know, people, who, if, if you're hungry and you can't eat, it's like, oh, I'm not going to be, deal with that right now. You know, we do, I've got work to do, I'm not going to deal with that right now. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's the thing, look, it's like how you just said then. <clears throat> it's... When it comes to mental health, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I'm so obsessed with it now in the whole psychology of things is that teaching people that they're responsible for their thoughts is a key aspect in helping them get control mm -hmm. because you, you, you may, and you may or may not have seen the same thing, but you probably will have. A lot of people with mental health issues almost speak about themselves as their body and their mind as a separate entity, like yeah. I can't control the mind. Yeah, yeah. Like I can't stop thinking this, and it's like you can, you can stop thinking that. Like well, I, I can't. It's just like you can. You've just not learned how to yet. You don't understand how to control it yet. Yeah. But you are, you are responsible for your own thoughts. You're responsible for your own choices. But that, the whole the onus of responsibility of your own choices and your actions percolates for everything else that mm -hmm. goes from not just the mental health to fitness and everything else because if somebody eats something that they know they shouldn't because it's going to go against their goal they've made the choice to yeah it's got, oh, I, I was I was craving really bad and I couldn't not eat it you, you could you just you, you don't pick it up mm -hmm. and you don't put it in your mouth and it's it's that people will place blame anywhere other than on themselves the situation that they're in in life is the fault of that person and because that happened and that only happened because that person did that yeah like I've, I've seen it a lot of people lose the job and it's not because they were continuously late it's mm -hmm. because the manager's a dick and they wanted to get rid of them yeah and it's just like are you, are you sure it's, it's a victim's it's a victim's mentality yeah um yeah it's, it's something i come across very very often um and I don't think it's, a, it's, it's, it's not quite fully binary in the fact that you've either got one or you haven't. Um, it's more like the, the, there is a sort of, to some people it's like, okay, yeah, this is the thought that's arrived and, this is, but, and you can do this, but it's going to be hard. Whereas like, because the, the, the two trains of thought in it are either you either, you know, you are a complete utter victim or you're completely in control. And it's like, then there's this, there's the transition period yeah. where it's like, okay understanding like because people saying oh i should just be able to do this or i i, I wanted to do that but I, I should just be able to do it and then they feel crap about themselves and then end up going on to do the thing that they shouldn't just you know self-sabotage exactly um and that idea of actually like what they think they think because it's hard to them they're a weak person yeah and it's no it's, it's it is hard like our barometer for what cl cl clarifies as hard work these days is a bit lower but it is going to be hard and it, understanding that actually yeah i'm gonna have to do this but it's gonna be hard the first time rather than just i should just be able to do it and it should just be easy no yeah you need to take responsibility but it's also going to be hard yeah and that's it and a lot of people it's the time that is the issue mm. how long is it going to take the time, that, the time that passes anyway yeah <laughs> and that, that that's the point that i always bring to me it doesn't fucking matter how long it takes to achieve that goal because that time is going to pass anyway and you can either spend that time feeling sorry for yourself and doing nothing and wishing 
you weren't in the situation that you're in. Mm. Or you can use that time to get yourself out of the situation that you're in. Because whether the situation you're in is your fault or is somebody else's, the other person whose fault it is isn't going to come and fix it for you. No. You have to just go, right, that person has put me in this situation, but it's my life and I have to fix it because they and nobody else are going to fix it for me. Yeah. So I'm just going to have to do it, yeah. whether I want to or not. Regardless of how pissed off you are about the fact that somebody's put you in a shit situation, you're still going to have to pony up and just do the work. Mm-hmm. And that's what a lot of people won't do. No. But, again, it comes from that large... Not not just social media, but general media as well, of the, the big bad government. Yes. Everything's the government's fault. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's not, though... The, yeah. the government suck in a lot of ways, but you still in control of your life. But it's, but the thing is, like I had to argue in uni about whether obesity was the government government's or the individual's fault, and I'm like, the thing is, it's 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 empowering and and disempowering, I guess, in equal measures, regard regardless of which way you look at it. If it's the government's fault, then there'll be a person that'll sit there and go, well, I'm not going to do anything now because until the government sorts itself mm-hmm. out and does this change for me. Um, at the same time, there'll be a person that goes, oh, oh, it's the government's fault. I feel better about myself and then I'm able to actually go and do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to work against that. And then there'll be other people that'll be like, they'll be like the, the you know the game stacked against me so I just have to work harder and then they'll accept that that and that will be helpful and then there's the, the equally if, the, if you say it's the individual's fault there'll be people going okay it's my fault I did this in six months time I could be looking a lot better and go I did this and then there'll equally be people like it's my fault yeah. so it's like it's like I, I, how you know, this is everything I am and at the same you know it's 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 a redu- it's technically a really redundant conversation it's like which one's the more helpful to you to get to where you want to be, which one would help you more? Yeah. Um, and if it, if it is the government's fault, you know, great. It's not. It's you know, it's a combination is usually the answer. Yeah. The answer in most questions of is it this or is it that, the answer is usually like both. <laughs> but like it is the combination of the government's not doing enough, and they have just done. You know, well, it wasn't the government. Is it? It's this cancer research that have done the campaign, but I think the government have just done one as well with the four hundred, six hundred, six hundred thing mm. which leaves me starving but <laughs> but there are apparently you're supposed to have snacks around that as well so cool i can have how many calories do i eat a day i can have 1900 calories worth of snacks based on that but um but yeah so the government the, the thing is the, the why i think the government will never get it right is like it's because again it's like saying that we're one population that all respond the same way yeah like the only thing that's you know individual nutrition individual and an understanding a, a degree of ownership of your journey to a degree of learning about nutrition and learning about what works for your body is really the answer to all of this yeah. like that would be you know the, what the government want to solve it will teach individualized nutrition and training in school maybe that might be a start yeah um, I mean even if even if in science mm-hmm. when you get to the point where you're talking about thermodynamics but in the respective how they talk about it in a physics lesson yeah but use the analogy and link it to the human body and mm. say another way that this works it doesn't just work during a reaction of water becoming boiling water and as the molecules oscillate at a faster rate the temperature goes up and then once the hydrogen molecule separates from the oxygen it go no, in the body mm. this is what happens the more you eat above this level you get fat and the lot just so that people can get even if it's just that basic understanding of how you get fat mm. where fat comes from it's not just the fairy but that the thing is in the middle of the night and sprinkles fat the, the government doesn't even have one unified theory of where that comes from the fitness industry certainly doesn't it's like they have they you know they, the, the government usually wants to blame fats or carbs or um, if they haven't blamed protein yet, I don't think, but well, they'll probably tell you that gives you kidney disease. <laughs> yeah, they do. But that, I think that is one of the issues. And that fruit rots your teeth. <laughs> Particularly in a smoothie. When it, when it comes to, like what we were saying before, about people saying, my way is the way, mm-hmm. and everybody wants, I think it just comes through a basic want of simplicity mm-hmm. in human nature. We want one thing to be correct, so that that's just how it is. Yeah. The problem with fitness is, that is the furthest thing from the truth. Mm-hmm. And one of the problems that we've got now with the perpetuation of a calories in, v calories out thing, the calories in, v calories out 
is completely accurate yeah. for weight loss. Yeah. It isn't that finite when it comes to body composition. No. And how people eat, the sources of your calories, the sources of your macros, will impact the way that you look, the way that you perform, and your health over a period of time mm-hmm. in very different ways, dependent on where you source your macros from. Oh, absolutely. And different studies being done, they're saying that like, all oh, people ate these, ca- these types of carbs and their insulin was spiked eight times a day. These people ate these kinds of carbs and their insulin was spiked three times a day and far less. And at the end of it, there was no difference in the health markers. And mm-hmm. It's like, well, that's fine over an eight or a 12 week study. But over an extended period of time of years, it would, over time, be different. And but not only that, you get difference in satiety from different types of foods. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you could get lean eating the right amount of protein and the rest of your food being cake. Mm-hmm. But some people would. Other people wouldn't be able to do that. Because I they feel could, like crap. The cravings would go crazy. The amount of energy that they'd have to train would be shit. They would be hungry as fuck all the time, which would lead them to overeat because you know you can only stave off hunger with diet coke for so long. Yeah. Um, Cherry Pepsi Max works better, but <laughs> <laughs> but the problem not is, a sponsor. <laughs> the problem is, is that that is where that is where it's going. It's, yeah. There's people, like I said, when you get people that don't understand something in its entirety, will take a statement that has come from someone that does. They don't understand it properly, and then they misappropriate the information to try and make it sound like their own thing, mm-hmm. and that's when good becomes bad. Yeah. Just through transition of it being delivered from one person to another person. Like, calories in, calories out is all you need to focus on. It's like, well, it's not. Mm-hmm. You need to know where your calories are, but yeah. you need to focus on where they're coming from. Yeah. You need to focus on how many calories you're taking in at different points of the day and what works best for different people. Mm-hmm. I have clients that if I feed them the majority of their carbs in the later portion of the day, they manage to adhere to a plan far better than if the carbs start in the morning. That works for me. Some people, if they don't have a, a, an ample portion of carbs in the morning, they've got brain fog yeah. until 2pm when they finally start eating a decent amount of carbs. Mm-hmm. Other people can eat carbs in the morning and that gives them brain fog because everybody's different. Yeah. Everybody reacts differently to different macronutrients. And that, that doesn't get enough enough push no absolutely right um, I'm going to need to start wrapping this up soon so I'm going to jump into the quick fire questions which don't have to be quick fire if you don't want them to be um, but this is bit, where you're going to try and make me rant isn't it? maybe well actually this, this does usually get the rant out of everyone <laughs> I said I've, not, I've never had a full hour of rant though but anyway the, que- the first question is what is the worst piece of advice you see people taking too much or giving too much um, we'll go with the negative first so you can finish on a positive the worst advice <laughs> to be honest I still see people that are within the fitness industry perpetuating the no carbs in the evening mm. the insulin fairy yeah. the insulin makes you fat that, that is something that is genuinely it's just, it's just shit advice people perpetuating this you need to massively restrict a specific macronutrient in order to be dieting mm-hmm. You need to either do low carbs or low fats or keto or what, and you don't. You don't have to do any of that. Being as balanced as possible is for me, for the majority of people, the best way to diet. Yeah. Balancing the calories out between proteins, carbs, and fats and varying the sources. But people still want to push that. Low carbs is the best, Mm. it's the best way to diet. It is for some people. Because some people function very well on moderate protein and high fats. Other people feel like hammered shit mm-hmm. when they're on low carbs. And it just doesn't work for them. But again, I think it comes back to that. People wanting their way to be the right way. Yeah. Delivering it. And that again, when we were talking about good people and bad people. The bad people, because they are right at the apex of the Kruger-Dunning syndrome where they know fuck all, but they are a self-confessed and a self-placed expert in their field. Yeah. They deliver their shit information with so much conviction. Yeah. People are like, they sound like they fucking know what they're talking about. It's just like, 
they don't yeah but they sound like they do and because they give their information with so much conviction so emphatically people just accept it it's truth yeah no matter how wrong it is and then you get other people that do know what they're talking about that because they second guess themselves and they have that doubt what you said before the they, more you know the more you realize you don't know yeah and they kind of there's a hesitation in the voice and it's just the way that they come across is very isn't attractive in the way that they come across and deliver the information yeah and I've just completely gone off on a tangent though from the That's original fine. point no it's perfectly fine um, yeah for me I've, I, I, I've used low carb personally I don't really give it to clients because I find that they, no one enjoys it um, I used it personally before I understood too much about nutrition and I think the simple reason it worked for me was because it was it was easy to stick to from a what do you eat point of view. It's just like, well, I can eat all of that as long as it's not got carbs in it. Mm. And that was, that. so as a result, my adherence was high and as a result, I was consistent. And I, I don't know what my calories were like at the time. I assume they must have been low, but um, but yeah, I, I, I wasn't, when I was like, that was when I was down to like 14 stone 11, which for like, you know, someone who's 6'2 is quite light. Um, I was gaunt and I looked like bloody skeletal. To me, that, that's <clears> it. It's that, for me, the psychology side of things comes into it with that because it's that restriction mindset. I've had people that have been to other coaches, they've been with personal trainers, they've tried it on their own, they've followed different books, they've done Slimming World, everything that they can think of and it doesn't work because they're dieting. In their mind, they're, they're, they're dieting. So it has to be this thing. Mm. And then I've explained to them, it's not that you can't eat that food, because you can. If you want, you can open the cupboard, you can take the packet out and you can eat it. You can do what the fuck you want. It's just that right now you don't eat like that. Mm -hmm. Because can't is a restriction. Yep. And as soon as you give somebody a restriction, whether it's self-imposed or it's being imposed by somebody else, there's that initial do I want it yeah yeah totally even if they don't want it I want it mm. but when he's just saying I don't eat like that right now that's a choice yeah, yeah. and when you're making the choice you're the one that's in the control so they know that if they want to at any given moment they can eat it if they want mm. but they're, they're choosing to not yeah and I've had some people just that simple thing that gaining that understanding has changed everything for them yeah I, that works really well when you kind of got someone who's diet well dieting or um, well changing their eating habits when they go out with friends mm. because if like they don't like they like if they say to a friend like oh I can't have a beer then most of the friends can go oh just have one just have one just, yeah. have, just have one or just have another one just have one you know I can't have one if you say I don't want a beer to a friend they go oh, okay. Some some friends are probably telling me, I go what are you pregnant or something because you're going lad banter and all that but. But the majority of the time, the response is different. And yeah. the same response, is that you're having that same conversation in your head. If you say can't have and don't want, can't have and don't want are two very different kind of conversations to have, even if you're having that conversation with yourself. Yeah. So the flip side to that question is, what is the best advice that you don't think people are hearing enough of? Um, best advice that people aren't hearing enough of. Probably just the being helped or made to realise that something that works really, really well for somebody else not working for you doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. Mm. So if somebody else that you're friends with or that you work with has done a low-carb diet and been fully successful with it, they, they smashed it, they lost all the weight that they wanted to, and then they've managed to maintain it afterwards and they've not gone back, but then every time you've tried low carb, you've not. You've mm. struggled like fuck, you've been miserable, you've not been sleeping properly, you've been moody, and you always rebound after. You do manage to get some of the weight off. doesn't mean that you failed. It just means that that style isn't for you. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you're stuck as you are and you're always going to be big. It just means that that one style doesn't work for you. Mm. So there's going to be something else that will. Cool. Yeah, I like that. Um, anything else that you personally want to add? There's nothing. 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 You don't just just jump into a ra random tirade or anything. Um, okay, final question. Um, this is I'm trying to. My idea with the podcast is to 
attempt to get high quality guests on and the idea of doing that is if I get them pre-approved by the people that I interview then hopefully my network grows in terms of the people that I'm working with um, rather than me having to go and find them using following the mental health hashtag on Instagram is there anyone that you think it would be valuable for me to interview? Um, Preferably someone I'm likely to be able to get hold of so not Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> <laughs> Um. I am just about to start working with Aaron Clark, okay. who is running the Mental Health Muscle. Okay, I, I know his name and I've seen him on Facebook, I think. He would be very good to speak to, Okay. to keep it more conditioned towards just the mental health side of things. Awesome. Um, I'm going to be doing a seminar with him oh, that's on the 24th. Yeah. 24th of March, but Aaron and I are both going to be creating video content where we're going to be speaking about specific areas of mental health we've we've done the preliminary I know the areas that Aaron's going to discuss I'm going to discuss my parts and it's just going to be a video that we're just going to kind of piece together okay. we might keep them separate and just put it out in different ways but um, everything we speak about is going to be mental health related because I'm going to be talking about the importance of identity okay with regards to mental health and success in, in anything that you're going to be doing yeah. on social media big important thing um, and Aaron he's just got a just his, his overall outlook okay. and his, his drive to help people with mental health is really good he'd be really good to speak to awesome I might um, bug you for an introduction at some point then. not a problem cool um, where can we find you on social media the easiest place to find me would be on Instagram through my page Arc Nutrition which is ARK. Yes. ARK Nutrition, all one word. Yes. Yeah, cool. Awesome. One of um, one of my guests four weeks ago, like she's like about 12 underscores in her Instagram name. <laughs> it's it's like, ridiculous numbers and uh, symbols. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, ARK Nutrition. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Um, I'm not going to plug anything this week, I don't think. No, I'm not going to plug anything. <laughs> on my, actually I will, on my um, Mindset by Dave Facebook page, I'm going to be putting up, I've just had a group of five different animations done explaining sort of little individual parts of mindset and mental health. They're all about three minutes long. They're going to be going up one a month for the next five months. Um, so if you don't already follow my Mindset by Dave page, which is facebook.com forward slash Mindset by Dave, um, give that a check out because those videos are kind of the appeal in a different way than sitting and listening to me talking for an hour does. I'll catch you next time. Your progress is our passion.